Welcome everyone and welcome Catherine on to this uh, second Training Done Right webinar. My name is Gail uh, Wetlin, I am the founder of Think Skills, and I am delighted to welcome Catherine Tyler today, social media and co-founder of A Digital Mom. She is going to share uh, best practice experience in creating um, incredible uh, processes to uh, set up uh, training that get uh, professional ready in six months uh, and um, allow them to be practicing all through the course uh, in real life, in real time, what is being taught. Digital Mom, a further program that uh, Kathleen has uh, created and co-funded, represents for me the excellence in training. It delivers concrete skills, is designed around the learner's needs, and it is flexible and incredibly performant. So we're very lucky to uh, have Kathleen with us uh, today. Things that you can kind of learn, and after I finish talking through each section, there's a whole slide where it's like, okay, what can you now take away and have a think about and apply to whatever it is that you're doing. So, um, just in terms of who, me, who am I? Who am I? Uh, I've had a slightly random career. I started as a geneticist, um, very random, but one of the great things about being a geneticist was it really helped um, with analytical skills and critical thinking and logic, which is actually quite helpful when running a business. But I didn't really like working in a laboratory. Um, I did some interesting work in obesity research and HIV vaccines, but laboratories, which is not the place for me. So I decided to completely change career when I was about 25. And I moved uh, more and more into kind of communications. My first role outside of the lab was working for a rights-based charity. Um, and one of the great things about that was it gave me this real uh, participation focus. And we had a youth panel who helped us to make all of our decisions. And I think that was probably the first step on my journey of really putting your customers or you know whether they're learners or whatever at the center of what it is that you're doing uh, from there i moved to the nhs which they were, they were not very good at involving anyone in anything i think they did one patient survey to adults despite the fact that 70 percent of their services were for young people so i did loads of work with them and transformed transformed how they worked with their patients including children and families which was really exciting and then from there i actually went to work at somewhere called the innovation unit Innovation Unit is one of the most amazing organisations. They used to be the Innovation Unit within the Department for Education. So I was working alongside top education consultants because they were still doing probably 60% of work uh, in the education space. But also they had a, a whole team of service designers that believed in the power of co-design. So if they ever transformed schools or hospitals, the first thing they would do is put um, patients or students at the heart of what they were doing. So that has kind of really helped to inform how I do everything at Digital Moms, which is very helpful. So seemingly random, but actually quite handy, almost fixed, some people might say. Uh, and then um, just a little bit more about sort of where we are with Digital Moms then. So we started officially trading in March 2014, and since then we've worked with almost 700 mothers. Uh, we've got a real focus on employment and employability. We don't really believe in training people so they get a certificate. We want to train them so they get a job at the end. Our flagship program, our flagship programs focus on uh, social media, uh, but we uh, upskill with digital skills generally. And currently 86% of our graduates are working as a result of our training. And this is the key uh, performance indicator for us um, because we are so focused on getting the jobs. Uh, so that's a little bit more about Digital Mom. So now let's kind of, and about me, so let's officially kind of talk through what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about something that is one of the most important values and ethos at uh, Digital Mom, and that is user-centred design. Uh, so putting learners and making sure learners are at the heart of everything that we do. So let me just talk through my story so far and how this applies to the story so far. So as soon as Nikki and I came up with the idea one day, sitting in a cafe over some cake, uh, we can have some of our best ideas come, come over cake. I'm, I highly recommend it. Um, so as soon as we came up with the initial idea for Digital Moms, we immediately 
started to work with mums and businesses because I'm not a mum and neither is Mitty and neither one of us is on a business. Uh, so we started working with mums and businesses to find out did they think it was a good idea? If so, you know, how much would they potentially pay for training? Um, what would the business need? What would the learner need? So right from the beginning, as soon as we had that initial kind of aha moment, that's what we started to do. We ran lots of surveys, we gathered data, we also did focus groups. Um, because I think data is very important, but you really need to uncover kind of stories behind the data. Um, so we did focus groups to gather that. And then we formed what we called our first co-design team, which was made up of moms and some small businesses that helped to inform our first official prototype. Uh, we worked with that team even to design the first lot of content that we did. So we actually would produce small bits of content and we would send it to our learners and we would ask their opinion, was it too complicated? Was it too straightforward? And we also kind of started to assess where they were in their learning journeys and how much kind of support and help they would need. So right from the beginning, that's what we started to do. And I think that's really helped um, with our success. So we've never kind of gone in completely the wrong direction because we haven't talked to people about what we're doing. And then we ran our first prototype. We kept it very small and manageable. So only eight students. Um, we gave them more surveys to find out what their needs were, and then we built a very lean prototype, um, just basic content. Uh, we used a very simple MVP, which is a minimal viable product, it's very commonly used in the tech space. So don't spend a million pounds building something, but spend as little as you can get away with. We spent nothing, so we actually used Google Plus community to deliver student forums, and we used YouTube to deliver all the content, so all absolutely free. Uh, and then once we'd finished running that, we matched the mums with a business and then we account managed in a kind of agency style that uh, business relationship for six months to understand what was missing, um, what were the challenges still, what, you know, perhaps did we need to add extra skills, extra training. Uh, so really it's just about gathering as much information as possible. That then fed into our first official pilot where we started to take 20 mums per month for six months. Um, we used all those insights that we gathered from the prototype to feed in. Uh, we still used free technology, so we used something called Instructure Canvas as our first official learning platform, where we housed lots more content and all of our assignments and grading and everything, but that was free. Um, so again, keeping the cost down to learn what did our, what do people need from an e-learning platform and which one worked the best and what did they like and what didn't they like. We set up um, much more robust kind of customer satisfaction procedures. Uh, we had formal quantitative surveys. Also, I just used to run a lot of informal drop-in clinics where people could just, if, particularly if I saw that there were lots of questions and perhaps some problems arising in like week 10, I'd say, do you know what guys, looks like there's a lot of problems happening. I'm just hosting a Google Hangout at eight o'clock on Wednesday. Just drop by, tell me what you think could be improved. So both formal and informal, um, but just a lot of stuff to gather as much information as possible. And then we did some synthesis workshops, which were fancy words for saying that we sat in a room and pulled together all those insights to understand what they mean. Um, and then that informed the official launched product. So a lot of work went into our first launched product and it took 18 months in total. Um, but through that, we learned a lot about, a lot more about delivering training. And so we've been able to launch further products more quickly because we've got all the systems and processes in place. So what do we do at the moment? We basically um, now do self-assessment to inform how much support we need to give the student and to give them a potential kind of risk factor um, that their course teachers and course facilitators can understand. You know, where are they on the social media journey on our flagship programme? How confident do they feel? Um, and then we just sort of, you know, that, that can help the course teachers to understand how much extra support they might need. We also informally uh, capture feedback via the student forum. So we monitor all the questions that come in and we will flag anything that is potentially needs to be followed up. Then there's very formal feedback throughout the training and beyond via uh, weekly surveys and monthly surveys. Uh, there's also, we still run focus groups and ad hoc drop-in clinics. There's nothing that can be face-to-face -face feedback. We also will conduct spot checks. Um, spot checks for one-to-one -one sessions with students, spot checks with group sessions with students, spot checks on assignments that are handing in to make sure they're required standard, that sort of stuff. 
and all this insight feeds into redevelopment and as we scale we will potentially do uh, elements of sort of mystery shoppers as well to maintain quality. I had a very useful meeting with the Burb team around quality. I know Burberry is very different product that they're selling, but they are nailing their kind of um, quality assurance processes. And I was just really interested to um, to kind of cross pollinate ideas and find out what they did. And they were just really helpful in uh, letting us know what they did and suggesting things that we could do. So we, we've definitely taken some of that on board. So what are the takeaways for you sitting, watching this, thinking, okay, what does that actually mean for what I'm doing right now, wherever you are in your journey? Um, I definitely advocate just a design approach. So always think, what is the challenge that I have? And particularly, you know, if it's a digital challenge, and then make sure that everything you do is really user-centered. So always think about the learner and placing everything around the needs of the learner. Do your research, but don't just measure data. Think about um, how you're going to capture other things that just you need to kind of search beneath the data to find out about because data is brilliant but it's definitely not the answer to everything uh, stay lean so particularly if you're building new stuff don't spend lots of money just always try and use free tools and resources um, and use those to then learn so that if you are going to invest money in building something um, you you know exactly what it is that you're going to need from that product and uh, start small so eight students is tiny but it massively has Helped us because if we'd suddenly done if we'd done 50 students at that point, it wouldn't have been manageable to run, and I don't think we could have gathered the kind of insights that we gathered. And then, obviously, the bigger you get, the more you need really robust systems for running at scale, and particularly with regards to quality assurance and customer satisfaction. So think about how you're going to implement those. And uh, we recommend an iterative process, which is again is a very design-led approach. We call our iterative process test, measure, reflect, and refine. But there's lots of other iterative processes that have been um, coined by big design agencies out there. But that's just the one that we use and what we call it. And constantly, we are improving what it is that we do. Don't just think, OK, I've launched my product. Now I can just sit back for the next couple of years. You're going to need to be constantly tweaking and improving, particularly in the digital space, which I'll talk to a bit more about later with the challenges of the ever-changing landscape of digital, which sometimes drives me completely mad. So user-centered design approach, I cannot advocate it strongly enough. And the service designers I work with at Innovation Unit have been so instrumental in the success of Digital Moms. Uh, I still meet with them and I get their advice. Um, if you can ever manage to speak to a product designer or a service designer, go and buy them coffee and cake and pick their brains because they're um, amazing. So next, um, it's obviously our learning models are innovative and we like to think they work very well. 86% um, of people are getting jobs on the back of um, our training. Uh, so what is it that we do that is innovative and why? So firstly, before I start talking about our learning models, I'm just going to talk through my inspiration. So when I was working at Innovation Unit, my general experience of learning was very poor, um, as I think was most people who attend normal schools. Um, I did very well at school, actually, um, but I wasn't engaged at all in my learning. Uh, thankfully, I found everything quite easy, uh, so I didn't need to be. Um, whereas my business partner, Nikki, she's very, very clever. Um, but perhaps not so academic. So she doesn't, um, you know, her brain doesn't perhaps lend itself well to the very strict and rigid ways that we expect students to learn. So she can't just read a book and regurgitate information in an exam, which I could do very well. So whether or not I remembered that two months later, <laughs> um, I mean, I didn't basically, uh, but it meant that I did really well in my exam. So everyone thought I was doing a brilliant job. Um, now, when I started working at Innovation Unit, uh, um, I was just blown away by some schools that were operating um, over the world that were just doing like the cooler stuff. So the first one was called High Tech High. They're a set of charter schools based in San Diego. Um, uh, last count, I think they had 13 schools in total, but they might have more now. They're taking over the world, hopefully. Um, and lots of our team went over to visit and they all just would come back just completely blown away by what was happening there. It looked nothing like a normal school. Um, and the reason for that is that they based their entire curriculum around uh, project-based learning. 
thing. Um, I'll talk to you a bit about that in a sec, but first of all, I just wanted to say that High Tech High, um, they have 99% of their students going to college, which is much higher than um, not just the San Diego average, but the national US average. And they don't select, there's no selection procedure. The students are taken from an algorithm to make sure that it's a representative sample of where they are. So they have really phenomenal results in a very traditional academic sense. Um, they do get great SAT scores, but that is not their, their they measure what matters for them, which is what students do after school. Um, I think that's a bit of a problem in our school is that we just care about their A-levels and then actually they could be unemployed um, and on crack at 25, but we don't care because we don't track that. Uh, whereas high tech high actually follow their students, not just to college, but after college to find out what they're doing. And they've got really phenomenal results. In terms of project-based learning, what does that mean at high tech high? Well, everything they do and everything students learn um, is based around multidisciplinary projects. Students lead and design these projects, um, and they're partly based on the passion and interest of the student, but also they're designed by teachers and it's based on the passion and interest of the teachers as well. And then all the content that they learn is scaffolded around these projects, and these projects apply learning in real world situations. And by that I mean they will create products that they sell on Amazon, or they will create um, you know, perhaps like multimedia presentations that they will go and deliver to architects um, in real life. Uh, we have a school in this country called School 21 that's really inspired by High Tech High and they got their students to design classrooms and they went and pitched to actual architects uh, to kind of to convince them why they should choose their architectural design. So it's very, very focused on real world jobs, whatever. Um, and then the projects go through multiple drafts, just um, as any project or piece of work would do if you were at work, like you don't just do one piece of one piece of work that then perhaps goes to your boss, you might send it to your colleagues, get some feedback, you'd send it then to your boss, you'd get some feedback from your boss. So they use that um, structured kind of student learning, uh, multiple drafts from uh, feedback from their peers, but also from teachers. Uh, so peer-to-peer -peer learning and critique is really built into the curriculum. And then everything they do is publicly exhibited, whether it's in the school or in the community. So it's kind of really transformative. And then another um, amazing set of schools that are actually operating not just in America, but in New Zealand, Canada, and uh, Israel, and a few other countries now, um, are called Big Picture Learning. And one of the things that I found most inspirational about Big Picture Learning was they have real world internships. And I don't mean that when students are like 16, they go and do two weeks of work experience somewhere. That is not what they do at, um, at Big Picture Learning. And I don't quite know how they manage it, um, because uh, it, students spend two to three days out every single five days at internships. I think once they've got to um, secondary school, uh, potentially post 14, um, and it's different at different schools, so it's not like one rigid system. But essentially, they're out and about on internships, learning real world skills and integrating any content that they're learning um, in, into those uh, essentially internships. Um, it's I, I, I don't even know how they managed to do it, but they do, and it's amazing. And a lot of the assessment that they have is, uh, is formative and regular, and it's linked to real-world goals um, and being job-ready. So, you know, they do really well with getting the student jobs at the end. Um, so I was very inspired by both of these uh, schools. And I took what I learned about what they were doing and applied it to adult learning, um, and it's it's doing what it's transferred and really well because I, I just always realized that old school traditional classroom models just really just didn't work so I was really inspired by people that had completely thrown out those models and had revolutionized the way that students were learning so they've really informed me so this is our real learning model so our learning methodology is called real learning um, and there's different elements to it. So the first element um, is that the learning is all applied in real time. So rather than just doing loads and loads of content and theory for, say, four months and then doing a project at the end, every single thing that they learn when they learn it, they apply in real time. So just in terms of, say, on the last landscape social media programs, uh, let's say Twitter, for example, um, there's a week where they set up Twitter and they access loads of content around how to set it up, how to make the profile look really professional, what to put in the bio, stuff like that. And then the following week they have to find um, online influencers that can really help them and their businesses. 
Um, and that week they access all the content around how to find influencers. So there's lessons and then there's practical application and loads of walkthrough tutorials. Uh, so that's the first one and something that we're very passionate about. We don't think learning sticks without it. And then uh, the next one is, um, that I'll skip it, is real world learning. So everything they do is real world experience. They don't do practice projects. They run live social media accounts. Everyone can see those live social media accounts. So if their tweets don't really work, they'll find out because no one will like their tweets and no one will retweet them. So all real world learning. Uh, they're very supported. So supportive communities is a really key one for us, not just in the training, but beyond the training. So all our alumni help each other with real world challenges post graduation. Um, and that is probably one of the pa most powerful things that we actually do. Uh, the next one is peer-to-peer -peer support. So structure peer-to-peer -peer learning in wherever possible. And this one is particularly important, we think, when um, we get them to critique each other's work. Um, critique, peer critique is just so important. It's not just great for the person who's receiving the critique, where they get you know, really good feedback on what it is that they're doing, but it actually really embeds learning for the person who is giving critical feedback. And then it helps them to think about, well, have I actually taken that on board with my own project? And then the final one, which we're really passionate about, is cutting edge technology. Part of this is, is um, I mean, it's not like mega cutting edge things like podcasts. It's thinking what format should your content be in? And a lot of the time for us, it's video and, uh, and um, video walkthroughs and podcasts. But also we have bought new technology called Touchcast, which allows us to do interactive video content where the students can interact with it to find out more if they need more information. So it allows an element of personalized learning. Um, and we're using that more and more. So I think always think, you know, I think sometimes people can skip to you know, a lesson or just a standard kind of tutorial webinar format. But just always think and look out for interactive um, technology that you can use and implement with your learners, because they we've got loads of feedback that the touch card videos, the students love them. So that is our real learning methodology. Um, you might be now thinking, okay, that's quite a lot to take in. How might that apply? And interestingly, I um, I got approached by, uh, it was actually my ex-boyfriend, I got my 22 runs with a recruitment company. And he said, you know, you're now this like, guru, his words, not mine, guru of training. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I am. Um, but he said, you know, loads about training now. And I, I basically take on loads of new graduates. Obviously, I select them for the, potentially the right types of personality for sales, but I have to then train them up. Can I talk to you about my ideas for how I'm going to train them and you can maybe give them feedback? I was like, yeah, no problem. Uh, so he um, said, firstly, you know, I've got 20 grads. Um, I need them all to be performing as recruitment salespeople for me in the next few months. I need to start, you know, bringing in the money. Uh, his plan was you know, understandably very much based on traditional classroom models, talk and talk. The only assessment he was then planning on doing was once they were actually out there on the sales floor doing real calls, and he was only going to train them in sales techniques. So um, I said, okay, this is what um, I think you should do and change about it. So he was planning on doing three days of offline training, 20 people in a room, all looking at a presenter, taking information, um, for three whole days of content, followed by then one day a week for three weeks with top-up training. Um, I said, okay, if I were you, I would completely flip that and I would produce that content, make it available online for students to access when they need it, and I would use all your face-to-face -face time uh, to embed the learning and to do practice and role play. I said, because there's one thing when you're learning content on how to sell to people, and it's quite another thing to put that into practice. So using our you know, live application of learning and real world learning. Um, I said, that's what I think you should do. So I think you should completely change it. And then he'd made no attempt to sort of build in any real life challenges. They were just gonna learn and then they were just gonna go out and do it for real. Um, uh, and then there was no sort of follow up training. So I said, can you structure in live sales calls once they reach a certain threshold of assessment? So if you think they're confident to do it. Um, and then you should probably shadow those live sales calls for a while, give them maybe a mentor, um, and then give them a kind of ongoing feedback and assessment while they're actually on the sales floor, which he thought was a great idea. 
Um, so that is just an example that fit with the live application of learning and real world challenges. And then I said, are you doing any peer to peer support? We're very passionate about peer to peer support and it's one of our um, methodologies. And he said, no, he wasn't. He was just saying, I'm doing one group, 20 people in the group. And I said, okay, well, why don't you think about doing four groups of five and then get those peers to actually work closely together they can do role playing and they can actually critique each other. There's, there's an exercise called like a fishbowl exercise where there's two, um, you can get, uh, you know, two people and then three people sh like, are watching what those two people are doing and then they can get feedback. So um, I said, I think that would be really helpful. And then, you know, he'd only planned on having a training consultant do all of the training. And I said, you know, just build in as much as possible that peer to peer, uh, which again, he thought was quite a good idea. Uh, just in terms of technology, uh, he was just doing that classic thing of just he was going to do presentations and then hard copy lessons. And I said, I actually think interactive video lessons would work amazingly well for you because you could record role play um, on video and then students could interact and unpick things they don't understand. So, for example, that you could have um, a role play of a sales call um, where someone is asking open ended questions. Um, and if at any point students don't really kind of understand what's happening, they could interact with the video and it would unlock another lesson where it's like explaining a lot more what's happening. So it allows them to kind of really understand um, things much better. Um, I said also you could include podcasts of sales conversations and then break down techniques so that they could actually be listening to these podcasts while they're commuting on the way home. It doesn't have to just be lessons. And I said, um, you're only doing sales training, but they're going to face other challenges. What about content around digital tools? Um, I showed him how to use something called Trello, uh, which is a great to-do list app, and Streak, which is like a sort of a, a free CRM uh, client relationship management software that you can plug into your emails. Um, and he said, what's Trello? And now he's actually using Trello. Um, so he's kind of implemented some of those ideas. And then I said, you're not supported, there's no supportive communities here. And we also were very passionate about that at Digital Moms. Um, and he wasn't planning on doing anything around that. And I said, well, what you could just put them all into like a Facebook group or a LinkedIn group um, where they can then just be um, working together wherever or even, um, you know, the, in a WhatsApp group. So just think about an actual building the, a community of these people that are all on the same learning journey together. And um, again, thinking about how they can support each other. So not digital at all, uh, just an example of how to take in recruitment training, you can use the real learning methodology. Um, and he also wasn't assessing learner needs. And I said, you don't know, all these graduates are going to be at completely different levels. Uh, so if you know where they are already, you can tailor content. So what can you take away uh, from this? So firstly, assess learner needs up front. Uh, and then allow for an element of personalised design and design for those learner needs. Don't just jump to traditional classroom models just because that is, you know, what most people do and it's the norm. Don't don't replicate that that old school chalk and talk model, but just put it online. I think a lot of people do that. A lot of people are like, oh wow, online learning is so innovative. But actually, they just take the normal classroom model where where you're in, you know, twenty of you are watching a video. Um, in, a, in a room and they just make that room online. Like that is not innovation. Um, scaffold all your content around real world application and just constantly be thinking what are they going to be doing in the real world and how can I scaffold content around that and also set them real world challenges. Always think about how students could be learning from each other, um, particularly because that's actually free. So I've got my, my digital mums learning from each other all the time and I, that, that costs no money for me at all, um, and it's really powerful. Uh, so it's just a really smart one. Think about what format your content should be and do not jump straight to a lesson. Just think, what is the best way of delivering this format and what is the best way of delivering this format for my learners? So one of the first pieces of feedback we got when we had our co-design team, when we came up with our first idea, we made this really long tutorial and our um, mom said, that's just not, that's just not going to work for us. I'd never get that much time in my diary uninterrupted. Um, I need stuff that's maybe like five minutes that I can dip in and out of when the kids are napping or in between tasks. So, you know, ask learners and think about format um, and structure of format. And then investigate using interactive technology, basically. There's stuff out there. Touch Class is just one example. 
Um, and particularly if it can allow students an element of personalised learning at no additional cost or complication to you. So those are some key kind of takeaways from uh, the Digital Mums Real Learning methodology. So I'm next going to talk to you about the mega challenge of the digital space. Um, and it's constantly changing, which is incredibly frustrating for digital moms. It drives us completely crazy. Um, so the first challenge of digital is that there's no sort of one answer. Um, every industry has got its own kind of digital challenges. Um, so think about designing for specific industry and challenges. So, um, you know, I've talked to lots of different industries. You know, I had a chat with the HR director in media one day. The next day I had a chat with a media director in, um, in the legal space. Um, so it's different for different industries. Sorry, my intern is just coming back. <laughs> um, and then think about designing for iterative development because it's never going to be static, essentially. So it's going to be changing all the time. So you need to think, how am I going to be continually improving my training? Because that is the, that's the, what's going to be happening. And then you need to build general digital <laughs> skills and capability that people can adapt to different technologies. So we can't teach our students purely what, you know, a couple of tools and all social media platforms. Because next year there could be a new social media platform and there'll be a hundred different tools. So you just got to think, I actually need to build general digital skills. So introduce them to lots of different apps and tools so that when they're faced, and also build their confidence. And when they're faced with a completely new app, they just go, okay, I know, I see how this works. You know, there's often there's some things that are standardized. Um, there's often, you know, settings are like a little cog. This, this stuff, and then once they get used to it, they just go, okay, I'll see how this works. I'll just, you know, uh, they can adapt it and they can pick up new and different apps. So those are some of the, the digital challenges that keep us awake at night. And if you work in a digital space, I'm sure they'll keep you awake as well. Um, and what we do to try and deal with these difficult, difficult situations is that we prioritise what we include to start off with because there are so many tools and apps we can't possibly teach them all. So we prioritise on the basis of the most popular and the most useful. And then uh, we get our course teachers, um, of which we've got like 15, to be experts. They could not, no one teacher can be an expert in everything. It's just not possible to hold that much information in your head. Um, so we kind of split them up and group them. So, you know, it might be that one of them is an expert on Twitter, one is an expert on Snapchat, um, and, the, and then some are expert on uh, tools that can help you in your work life, like Slack, for example, which is a bit like a sophisticated WhatsApp, or Facebook for work. And then we also actually use the graduate community that all of our students join um, once they've graduated. And we crowdsource digital updates and some content from our graduates who are obviously doing the job. So um, we think about how we can harness those people that are doing the job to help us with um, content and to feed in uh, tips and things to our students. Um, and then sometimes students will actually flag updates in the forum and we have a formal kind of process for capturing that particularly because something like Facebook will do A-B testing. So um, often, um, so we, we, we kind of set up Google alerts so we do find out from Facebook when changes are being made, but we can't make a video walkthrough update because we don't have that change available yet because they might only test it with 10% of Facebook business users. Um, but um, sometimes our students have got it on their business accounts because they're one of the 10%. So we then um, will have a chat to the student uh, to get a bit more inside what's changed and that's all kind of then we do a quite adult but formal content review every six months uh, and an informal content review every three months. So every six months we formally go through the content and just flag what needs to be updated. And we use Evernote to tag that content. Um, so our lessons are tagged with lots of things. So if they mention Vine, which is an app for um, creating video, which is now just in the last month gone, it's been just gone out of date. So it's, it's basically been discontinued doesn't exist anymore, we can go into Evernote and find where it's referenced and take it out so that our students don't go, okay, I can't, I don't, how can I use fine? And actually they can't use fine, this doesn't exist anymore. 
And then we have uh, ongoing training regularly for all of our teacher team and also our facilitation team as well. And some of our facilitators also work as, um, so the ones that are facilitating social media management courses actually are social media managers on site. So they're keeping their hand in uh, one day a week with like a client, which is really helpful actually. So kind of that's the stuff that we do, which it looks quite easy because it's captured on one slide, but it is a lot of work. Um, and so in terms of what you can take away from that, it's really key to design for whatever market you're operating in within digital. You really need to prioritize. So there are thousands uh, of digital tools out there. So you just need to prioritize which ones you're going to actually include because you'd never be able to keep on top of uh, covering everything. Think about how you're going to catalog and tag your content, because you're going to need to update stuff regularly. That is going to be key. So we use Evernote, um, which is really useful. Uh, we, we, we find it great, and it's also um, really cheap. Uh, but there's other ones out there that you might find better. Um, we we build relationships with digital providers. So I meet, I meet Snapchat next week, for example. So actually, um, we build relationships with those people and they let us know when stuff is updating in slightly in advance of time and they kind of help us to think about what those updates mean then for our training which is really great that just involves a lot of schmoozing and again a lot of cake um which is a hard job but someone's got to do it um and then we use tools like google alerts and rss feeds on blogs to stay up to date um with changes of different tools that we've included and then really think about CPD for your trainers. So you've got to think about how uh, you're going to keep the the skills of your team up to date because that is just an absolutely crucial one. And then lastly, what I'm going to talk to you about is one of my favourite things in the whole world, and that is um, flexible working. Um, so at Digital Mums, we have a team of 30 people, 28%, 20. 28 of those are working moms, and they all, to some extent, will work flexibly um, and remotely. So we work with them to create uh, what we call work that works. So it's a way of flexible working that works for them, and it's a way of flexible working that works for us. So let me just use our course facilitators as an example. Course facilitators constantly ask and on. Uh, answer questions from students. Now, because our students are mums, most of these questions come in at 8 o'clock in the evening because all of the mums have basically done everything they need to do that day and they're kind of sitting down. Some of them have got a glass of wine, they've got their laptop and they've got a few hours to actually get some work done. Um, now, because we um, have flexible working amongst our course facilitators, we've always got cover, not just at 8 o'clock, but also at weekends. So it's a flexible option that they love that works for them but also it really makes sense for our business and the reason that we call our way of sexual working work the works is because we think that it needs a little bit of a rebrand because a lot of the um, rhetoric around flexible working is very kind of employee led so employees getting to work when they want to work and then I think some businesses can just initially just be quite resistant to that and think how is that going to work for my business but actually if you're open-minded, it can work very well for your business. It worked amazingly for us when we were startup because we had um, people just doing part-time jobs and we couldn't, quite frankly, couldn't afford for them to do full-time jobs. Um, it worked amazingly well for our very senior head of learning position because there's so many skills needed for that job that actually it made way more sense for it to be a job share between two people anyway. One, um, one of the job shares has got marketing background and one's got an education background. So. It works not just for them, but it works for us. Um, and we uh, commissioned some research this year uh, on work that works, uh, just to see mainly um, what benefit it would have on the economy if people offered more flexible working. And just, in, just some headlines um, from that research. So even though there's now the right to request flexible working, 60% of mothers still don't have access to flexible work. So the right to ask isn't really doing anything. Uh, not that we ever thought that it would. Um, and only 14% of mums uh, felt their skills hadn't been or wouldn't have to be compromised at all to find a flexible job. So for those that did work flexibly, very most of them had had to compromise um, and take more junior positions, which was very frustrating for them. And then just in terms of economic economic benefits, so we said, okay, 
you don't have access to flexible working, but would you want it? And so in terms of stay-at-home mums, 68% of stay-at-home mums would go back to work in some capacity if they could find flexible work that fit around their family, which equated to 30 million additional hours to the economy. And then mums that were already working, if they could have access to more flexible work, would work more hours. And that, uh, that was 70% of working mums. Uh, and that would equate to an additional 36 million hours to the economy. So actually, if you added all of that up, it could potentially deliver an additional 62.5 billion pounds to the uh, economy every year. Obviously, that work needs to be out there, but the work would be out there, I think, if businesses were more open to sector working. And we would not have got to where we were today in such a short space of time, bearing in mind that I think we had four staff about two years ago, and now we've got five staff. Um, and we quadrupled our annual turnover in the space of 12 months if we hadn't been offering sexual working, partly because we get this ridiculous and amazing talent. So when I advertised our head of learning position, the people that applied for it were just completely off the scale in terms of like how well they were qualified because we predominantly got mothers applying uh, because they wanted to work part time and flexibly. Um, so it's just massively benefited our business, which is why we're a bit evangelical about it. We're talking about it everywhere in all the papers and things which you might have seen. Um, but what does this mean for you? Um, I think at a very basic level, if you want to offer more uh, a workplace that works a lot better for working parents, um, it's very obvious that if you are offering training, it's got to be online. I think some people make the mistake of structuring face-to-face -face training all day, like nine to five, like, work, like it's terrible timing um, because school run timings and stuff like that. So actually like face-to-face -face training, if you are going to run it, offering it between 10 to three, um, it's just going to, it's just going to help working parents. Um, if you're going to train working parents, try and train them together because actually they're on a shared, um, they've got a lot of shared experiences and I think actually we've seen how much our students bond with each other and how much our graduates bond with each other and they actually meet each other offline, meet up for wine, um, purely because they're in the same location and they're all in the Facebook group. Um, and I think that don't underestimate the power of potentially training people with those shared experiences together. Um, we structure all our peer-to-peer -peer work to happen during the evening, um, which I think is something to consider. Um, and it's a really great time often for working parents. We offer training in digital tools that will help people to work flexibly. Um, Slack, we use something called Slack, which I, just, I mentioned earlier is like a sophisticated WhatsApp. Um, it's incredible and our remote, our, one of the best, one of the things I love the most about it is that it takes, well there's two things I love, it takes all of our internal comms out of email, um, which is brilliant, um, and it actually is a time saving device for me because I don't end up getting copied in emails and reading them when I just think I did not need to read that email. Um, but also one of the things I love about it is that it actually helps to create a culture within our remote team. So there's actually like loads of Friday fun that happens on Friday afternoon where people share like comedy gifts and things like that with each other, even though people don't um, meet face to face, um, which is really nice. So there's lots of tools like Slack and Trello, which I also mentioned earlier, and uh, online kind of project management tools. And also obviously, you know, Skype and Google Hangouts and things like that, that can really help uh, people to work flexibly and remotely. And then I think one of the biggest things that would make a difference to flexible working is um, offer training to middle management on how to actually do it. And I think including those digital tools within that training is really important. But also, I think the first step is to convince them of the value of it. Um, because I think a lot of chief executives and very senior leaders are quite on board because they realise that it's about retaining talent. But also, I think they're all re waking up to the fact that now millennials would take flexible working over pay increases. So it's not just working parents that want to work flexibly. Um, but often it's the middle management who have to actually make it happen and sort of do the logistics that get a bit freaked out about it. Understandably, I totally get that. Um, so I think offering training to them, not just on getting them aware of the importance, but also how to do it practically, I think, um, would really help you to be uh, to be enabling a kind of a really healthy, flexible working culture in your organisation. Um, so that's it. That's, um, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. So hopefully um, I've given you some good kind of takeaways that you can... Uh, learn from digital mums and uh, if there are any questions, Gail, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you so much.
very much, Catherine. It was a fantastic presentation, and I think it's quite an eye opener for the world of training, which is uh, still quite conservative and looks at the digital tool in a way that, as you said, it's just transferring the face to face classroom straight into the, uh, the um, online world. And that unfortunately doesn't work. People are disengaged. It's um, training as an event and not as a, as a skills. Um, tangible skills gaining. So I think it was a fantastic presentation and a lot of takeaways. Wow. Um, I just um, just wanted, I've got a, a full two pages of questions and I'm going to unfortunately have to trim down if we want to stay into a, a bite-sized uh, video. Uh, so um, just a few, a few questions. For example, uh, you've given a little bit of uh, an insight about the personnel you create for your course. Do you want to maybe just dwell a little bit more, maybe for a minute or two, on how, you know, you came up with, uh, how you created the person that, you know, is driving the digital mom course, um, course structure. Ah, so you mean, uh, I guess, like the sort of learning persona? Yes, the learning persona, yes, yes. the proper. Um, well, really, it was uh, having lots of initial chats with um, moms in focus groups and I guess, so my background is kind of digital marketing and digital communications. And so actually it comes quite naturally to me to have a concept of like user personas. So in the digital marketing space and website build space, it's, it's a very commonly used phrase, your user persona. And it's also um, something that the service designers would always do straight away. It's like, okay, who is the person? Um, and sometimes it's three different user personas. I think I would, I would, not do any more than three because then actually you've just got too many people to kind of think about but i think having one to three fleshed out user personas is really useful um and in terms of the user persona it's like you, you don't just think how old they are and where they live it is it almost try and get inside them as if they're you know a friend of yours someone that you know really well and think about their motivations and think about their challenges and think about their pain points and how we got to develop our user persona was essentially talking talking to a lot of mums that were having challenges um, and identifying particular industries that um, were more challenging than others, what we could do about it, um, and getting a sense of their lives, uh, what their day-to-day -day routines look like. We weren't mums ourselves, so we were just very aware that it was super important to talk to a lot of mums. Thankfully, a couple of my friends had just had children, so that kind of helped. Like, I can see firsthand like, what their crazy lives are like. Um, but ultimately, it was just talking to a lot of people. We did initially do surveys and data, um, but that was mainly to find out whether or not people thought it was a good idea and you know how much they would pay and stuff like that. But um, then to ask them to give an email if they were willing to have a follow-up conversation. And it was those follow-up conversations that helped to inform what those user personas look like. So we've got a really good idea of the average age, um, the kind of daily routines, the weekly routines, what kind of content would work, but also where they were on their journey, how confident they were. That was a really big one um, because I don't think we'd quite realised when we started the low confidence that a lot of mums can have when they've been out of work for a couple of years. So, so we really had to structure the first few weeks of the course to be quite gentle and also just put a lot more um, kind of touch points with facilitators and teachers that perhaps we thought we might have to. Um, so that's it. It's basically talking to people. So I would definitely advocate getting some of the potential learners on on phone and in a focus group. And do you think it's uh, that's a that's a really interesting? But do you think it helps also to have your teacher um, having the similar lifestyle to your trainees? Yeah, yeah, it massively, massively helps. Um, and we tend to recruit teachers that are graduates that worked in have worked in the field um, doing that particular job for six months. So not just are they they're also mums but they were also a student so that's you know they're so inside um what those students need so it's a massive advantage for us but if you can't do that which sometimes you can't um then i would just make sure that that course teacher is just really inside the user personas and potentially involved in some of those focus group discussions as well um or perhaps you can record some focus group discussions to get um, new course to, you know, because if you hire a course tutor 12 months later, you can just really help them to understand, um, you know, what is it about those user personas and, and get them to really think about who that learner is. 
That's a very that's a very clever trick. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. And going back to the teacher, um, um, a lot of people in the training industry and a lot of trainers and uh, facilitators are extremely worried about um, technology because they are concerned that technology is going to steal their work. What are your views on that? Do you think there is, when you start having self-study material and all this kind of thing, what's the space of the tutor in that in that area? How 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 do they position themselves? Do you think they actually have less work or more work? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, the thing about teaching and learning is there's just no getting away from like the human element. So I think you always need to think about how digital is actually going to add value. Um, there's always going to be a role for course teachers. So, for example, you know the flipped classroom model that I talked about. So you might think, oh, but if you record content and it's not delivered live you know, suddenly there's no need for course sheet just because like, they're, they're all the content's recorded in a bank somewhere. But actually then it's like what the course sheet is then do is, um, is more, I guess, traditionally in the higher education sector, is I guess what they call kind of seminar work. So it's actually really deepening the learning, getting people to kind of practice what they're learning with the teacher. So at High Tech High, um, they, uh, they have like you know the flipped classroom model, so a lot of the content is available online, and they don't. There's no talk and talk. So that in in the actual face to face time with the teachers during the day, they never stand at the front talking to the students because that is all recorded and given to them kind of outside of um of those kind of structured sessions, um and they're reading it in between doing their project. The time they have with the teacher is to be asking critical questions about their projects and for the teacher to be supporting them to answer those really difficult questions that they have, um, which obviously you're never going to be able to do with a recorded lesson. The student is always going to have follow-up questions and problems understanding and if they're trying to then apply that learning, all sorts of other questions will arise um, that you didn't even know they were going to have. And that is where your course teacher is absolutely key uh, and which is never going to be replaced by any technology. That's a fantastic answer, and I think it's actually quite uh, quite right. That actually removing the informational part and taking it aside makes the teacher role actually more exciting because you actually get involved into real case, real applications, real challenges instead of um, of uh, of actually just um, banging information on. So I think I think it's a it's a very good uh, very good insight. Okay, interesting. Thank you. It's a really good question because. Innovation Unit are attempting to bring the high tech high model to the UK and one of the things they found quite challenging is that it's the role of the teacher becomes very different and some teachers absolutely love the new role and they're much more satisfied by it but some of them are really scared of it you know they've been doing that one way of working for like 20 years suddenly to have their role completely change um, you know it's, it's quite scary so I, to I totally understand the kind of reticence. It is a big change and it is also really getting out of the comfort zone when you actually have done something for a long time. It's um, you've used to processes, a uh, way of saving yourself time. When you actually go back from scratch from the beginning and doing something in a totally different fashion, it's actually much more time consuming before it gets it gets easier. And I think that's something uh, online online and digital training is bringing to, um, is bringing to realization. Also, I guess when you um, when you were a trainer and created your first face-to-face -face course, it did take a long time to, to actually make it happen. But as the years go, it's become your routine and it's easy. And now you have to go back and relearn. And it's difficult. It's difficult um, for people. So I think it's, as you said, it's change management is actually sometimes quite hard on some yeah. people. Yeah, definitely. And so um, one last thing that I uh, really um, enjoy listening uh, about is uh, your design for iterative development and you write digital change uh, quite, uh, quite a lot. And uh, I, a lot of people start with a technology as a solution and you actually advise to do exactly the opposite, is that not to pick up any technology and be flexible and adaptable um, Constantly, so you you're not you're not stuck with one model. Is that is that is that your views on technology? Um, I think it's about this, this, there's so much technology out there. I think that's part of the problem. It's almost like there's too much choice. 
uh, and it's difficult to know kind of what what to pick. Um, and then I think once technology has been chosen and people have been trained in that technology, that's it. People are like, right, that's it now. That's the technology that we're You're using. stuck with it. Yeah. Um, and I definitely think that because new things are coming out all the time, you've got to be really open to new technologies that are coming out. Because actually, if you've had a piece of technology for three years, it's probably not innovative and cutting edge anymore because something else might have replaced it. Um, and so we are always, we've always got kind of one eye like on the future. Um, and we meet, you know, new startups occasionally that have got like new technology that they're testing in beta and things like that just to kind of be like, to, you know, could that be uh, a potential because we always want to be on that cutting edge of technology. Thankfully, the touch glass that we use is still there, but you know, three years time, who knows what's going to be available, right? So um, I definitely think that you need to kind of be open to change. And I think if you create a digital culture in your organization, so you don't just train them to use one technology, you're getting them to use other apps and tools, that actually your staff can pick up new technologies quite easily. Um, and I think also that's quite important. So don't just have them doing two pieces of technology that they tra you train them to do because actually building their general digital confidence and skills helps them to then just pick up other technologies. And also to come to you and say, have you seen this new app that I think could be really cool to use? You know, so I think having kind of a, di a digital culture is, is great. And thankfully, you know, we've got very digital staff at Digital Monthly. Um, Fortunately. <laughs> so we're quite, we're definitely quite lucky in that respect. Um, but there's lots that you can do, I think, to, um, to help your staff to be more digital. And the more apps and tools you use as a company, the more digital they're going to be. Absolutely. So, um, so it's something, it's about, it's not about technology, it's about the spirit of digital learning. It's a different uh, thinking process when you create content. Yeah, I think so. I definitely think it's a, a different way of thinking. And the more you use digital tools and technology, the easier it is and the more it becomes second nature and the more you will just immediately think, is there a digital solution to what I'm currently doing manually? Or is there um, something that I can do here with a digital tool that's going to really help my learners? That's amazing. And I can first and say, because I had two uh, uh, digital, 20 digital mom uh, helping me with my different campaign, I can definitely say that's a, a program that works beautifully and that really achieves the result that promises. And, uh, and apparently you have to enjoy it even more with cakes. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Catherine, for this uh, fantastic insight in uh, content development for the digital um, digital world, but and uh, digital work as well. So thank you very much for your time today, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, we'll work again uh, together soon. Yeah, no, for sure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.